Uh, well, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's uh, our great honor to have uh, Professor Zachary Steiner uh, Direct Health to give us a talk. Uh, okay, so Professor Steiner Direct Health is an assistant professor uh, at UCLA's uh, Laskin School of Public Affairs. So his research interest lies in the uh, comparator politics and particularly, you know, using social media data to study subnational conflicts and protest. So um, uh, like methodological wise, uh, he's a leading, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> he's a leading expert uh, in using uh, like uh, geolocated social media tweets to use agent-based modeling and combine with geolocated data and images to study, you know, uh, uh, protest individuals at a like very refined individual and daily level. So uh, his uh, leading expert and his uh, articles has been published in top journals, include from political science to actually some of the data science and even physics uh, journals. So without further ado, uh, let's uh, welcome uh, Zach. And okay, so the floor is yours. Awesome. Uh, thank you, Han, for, for the introduction. Uh, thank you, Jamin, for, for inviting me out. Uh, here we go. Um, Han is also one of the leading experts on, on this work, uh, also in terms of protests. So um, he, he's, he's being modest, but I, I appreciate the, the praise. Um, so anyway, so what I'm gonna do today is, is give you a talk about how to use images in research. Um, it is based on a methods paper that is, is at this URL. Um, and so it's going to be primarily a methods talk, but it's still gonna be pretty high level. Right to, to be able to explain how a convolutional neural net, network works, it, it would, you know, could be a whole semester, right? So I'm just going to try to do it in 45 minutes. So I'm going to I'm going to brush over a lot of stuff. Um, this paper, as well as a lot of my work, is joint with with Jung Siak Ju in the Communication Studies Department at UCLA. Okay, and so I appreciate everybody's uh, time, both at at the Summer Institute and and also for coming to to my talk. I really appreciate it. Okay. So we can study images now for the same reason that, that television came after radio and streaming video came after streaming music, which is that images require a lot more hardware to process. And it's not until the last 10 to 15 years that we really had, had the capabilities, both in terms of storage and computing power to analyze images. And so in the social sciences for a long time, we've talked about text as data, and, and my work, as well as Han's work, is, is trying to show people that you can also use image as data. Okay, so images are important because individuals are visual processors much more than, than literary processors, more than reading things, that they, they comprehend things and they jump to conclusions based a lot more on what we see than, than what we read. And then in terms of the social sciences, it can improve measurements and permit measurements of things that, that couldn't be done in the past. So let me, let me explain what I mean a bit more by those. Uh, this is a very famous image from, from Birmingham, Alabama during the US civil rights movement of a peaceful black protester being attacked by, by police dogs. Uh, this is a famous image for, from Abu Ghraib, an American prison in Iraq, clear mistreatment of prisoners on Americans' part. Uh, this is an image of then mayor of London, Boris Johnson, uh, having a technical malfunction as he was trying to, to drop into, into a rally. And what all these do is they encapsulate something that we think embodies the deep, complex, underlying political issue. And you can see this image, you post it on a newspaper, and people can decide very quickly that Johnson is a buffoon or he's a fun-loving guy. Okay. In the paper, we provide a whole lot of scenarios in, in which you can use images to understand issues that are important to different ac academic literatures. So I don't really wanna go into that here, but if you click on each of these URLs, on, on each of the hyperlinks, it'll take you to papers that are examples of that. Uh, I'm gonna skip the violence thing just in the interest of time. And I'd like to talk about theoretical concepts that are really important in the study of, of protest in, in, in my world of, of the social sciences and how we can use images to measure things that the theoreticians have said matter, but that we haven't really been able to study in the past. So I think you could study free writing by measuring uh, the size of crowds and images, 
and then you can estimate who was exposed to those images. And then you can see if that the more broadcast of images of crowds there is, the more likely or the less likely people are to free ride. That is, if I see that 5,000 people are already protesting, maybe that makes me less likely to protest. That would be free riding. On the other hand, if I see 5,000 people protesting, maybe that makes me more likely to protest because that suggests the cost of protesting is lower. So these are complete competing expectations about free riding that we haven't really been able to test except for like in the lab survey experiments. There's also a lot of work on how the identity of people protesting affects the decisions of bystanders to protest, affects the decisions of people who are not protesting to decide to protest. And so we can use computer vision, apply it to faces in images and get demographic information about the people at protest. It's very easy to estimate their, their gender, I should say their sex, um, their age roughly, and then race actually not so bad as well as, as long as you know, like there's not smoke, it's not overcast, you know, a lot, a lot of, I won't say a lot of conditions, but you know, I'm not saying you can always do it, but you can do it much better than you could by having enumerators go to a protest site. So if we apply image analysis, if we apply CNNs to image analysis, we can start to understand how identity affects protest dynamics. Okay. Uh, Lane, uh, getting some, some, some vocabulary out of the way. Computer vision does not mean just the techniques that I'm showing you today. The techniques that I'm showing you today and that, that I use and that Han use and a bunch of other people use are like the modern iteration of computer vision. But computer vision is just using statistics to understand the content of an image. And it goes back, you know, as long as we've had, had computers, essentially. An artificial neural network is, it's a hierarchical model where you have, uh, you have input, you, ha you have a, 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 an input at the start, and then you perform operations on that. The output from that operation go is the input to a next set of operations, so on and so forth. A convolutional neural network is a type of artificial neural network where you perform convolution, which is just a, a mathematical operation. And that's, that's, that's how we distinguish a convolutional neural network from, an, from a, an old school artificial neural network. Now, a CNN does not have to be deep per se, where deep means an artificial neural network with several layers. So when you, if you take a class and you learn about a neural network, they'll just start with a one layer neural network and you just output class probabilities or regression coefficients and you're done. But then if the output of one layer is then an input to another layer, you have a deep neural network. And so the advance that, that we have with, uh, with uh, I always forget his first name, Lacan, I wanna say George. But anyway, the advance we have with him is to stack a bunch of convolutional neural networks together as a deep network. And that is the modern implementation of, of computer vision. So what can you do with images? What sort of data can you get from images? So the, the most uh, high level one is, is the class of the image, which is generally called scene classification. And I think of it as just saying, what is this image about? You can think of if you had a text and you're doing topic modeling of a text, is this text about, about political violence? Is this text about the right to vote? That's what scene classification is for images. So in my case, I do scene classification to understand if the image is of a protest or if the image contains violence. This is really the main type of analysis I, I do in my work. And so what you do is you take the, the final output for the final layer of your convolutional neural network, and then you map it to, the, to, to a vector that's as long as the number of classes that, that you have. So if you want to know if an image is protest or not, then it's just a vector of, of, of uh, length one. If you want to know if the image is of a protest, if it contains police, if it is of a sporting event and so on, then the final, the final vector is going to be as many of those classes. You have three, three in the example that I just gave, okay? Object detection is, is like scene detection on a specific part of an image. And so 
you have an algorithm which first isolates what it thinks are objects in an image, so distinct parts of, of an image. These are usually rectangles. And then those rectangles, those parts of an image, are the, the actual images that get, that get classified. So it's like you decompose an image into sub-images, and then you classify the sub-images. So this is just sample output from, from the Google Vision API. They give you uh, bounding boxes and then class probably the, the most likely class, the most likely object for each bounding box. And then, and then you know, the researcher you can you add, you make it look nice like this. And so you can see it identifies a helmet, it identifies a rifle, it identifies people, it identifies kitchenware, and so on. So this is scene classification on objects. One object that can be detected is a face, right? Um, okay, so Google Vision didn't show us any faces. And so you have, you have, it's very easy to detect a face because they're pretty universal. They're symmetric. They have, have two eyes. The mouth is, is in between the eyes and there's a nose between them and they have, you know, around, around shape. So you could, you could at first just detect faces and count the number of faces or then you can, can analyze the faces to tell you something more about what's, what's going on. If you want to make face detection a multi-class problem, what you're doing is, is like face recognition. And so, for example, if you want to, to have um, surveillance and see if people passing by on a street are, are criminals, then you're going to have a, a, a vector, the, the, the final, uh, vector output vector from your your CNN is going to be as long as the face database that you have, and then it'll give a a probability. It'll give a whole bunch of, but not really probabilities. Let's call them ratings, and then the highest rating is is the face, and then you compare that to some separate database of 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 criminal faces and see if they match. Okay. This is how automatic tagging works in social media, as well as the security example that I just defined. Okay. What I think is more interesting for, for social scientists are the demographic traits that I alluded to in the, the motivating example, and then actually emotions as well. So in a 2017 paper with, with Jung Siak, um, we show that you can measure the, uh, the anger at, at protests. Uh, I don't think we do fear. I think we just did anger. And that what that is, is you're looking at, at people's facial expressions. And so this is a whole separate category of research is how to infer emotion for, from faces. But, but if you think emotion is an important input to, to whatever political decision you care about, then measuring the emotions in, in faces is, is gonna be a valuable task in your, your image work, okay? So here's just another example of a person attribute recognition. Uh, this output is actually from um, a separate model called Fairface that, that Jung Siak put, put together. So it's not Google Vision, but you can see it, it, it gives you the same, um, it represents output the same way. It gives you a rectangle and then, and then faces, and then it has a database of, of um, prominent faces and gives you what it thinks is the face based on um, the highest class probability out of that vector that's as long as the number of faces it's trying to match to. Okay, let me pause here. Okay, so now I want to um, briefly uh, give an intuition for how a, a convolutional neural network works, okay? So an image is represented, let's go to black, as a, uh, three-dimensional matrix, so an array, where each dimension is a red, green, or blue uh, color. And then usually the matrix is 224 pixels by 224 pixels large. It can be larger or smaller, but by the default is generally 224 by 224. And then each value is from one to, it, to 255, it's an intensity value for that color. So the image gets represented as a 3D array. 
you then have a kernel. This is also known as a neuron, also gets called a filter. And what it is, is just a matrix of weights. This matrix is of a smaller dimension than the input image. Usually it's three by three, but you can make it four by four or whatever. Uh, let's just make it like this, like that. Da, 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 da. And so the kernel slides over the input matrix. It performs a convolution. This is uh, a mathematical smoothing. It performs this convolution over the matrix as it slides using these weights. And then once you have the, the output from the, the kernel being slid over the, the input matrix, so for this first layer, the, the, the raw image, it outputs another matrix that then gets filled, uh, filled uh, fed to a, a nonlinear transformation, which is usually what's called a rectified linear uh, unit, I believe. Yeah. And then, so that, that, that makes all negative values zero and keeps all positive values. And then the, that matrix is again passed to um, a pooling layer, which is another uh, matrix that then just takes the largest value in, in, in the part of the image it's looking at, at as it slides over. So it's another smooth name, okay? What the convolutional neural network is doing, what building this model is doing is estimating these weights. You'll initialize a model with some weights, but then training the model is about training, is about figuring the optimum weights based off of labeled data that you have, right? So then you have another kernel, another neuron here. That's three by three. It's gonna take, what was, I never, line up my thing. So let's do it here. It's going to take the input. Uh, I'll call this weight apostrophe. And then its output gets passed to a rectified linear unit and then a max pooling layer and so on. Okay. So each of these big boxes is a layer. You can have multiple uh, what are called channels per layer. So that is, you're not taking one image and then just doing this operation once. So you're not just having, uh, if we have three layers, you're not gonna have just three neurons. You can have as many channels as you want, six channels, 14 channels, 96 channels. And so each channel is going to replicate this process for however many layers you have. These channels are also called feature maps. They're going to pick up their own unique thing about the image. Okay. So then uh, you do all that. At some point, you decide I'm done with my layers. And then you're going to take the outputs of those layers to then get the, the classifications that you want. And so that is then you pass the final feature maps to a fully connected neural network, goes to another fully connected neural network. That output then goes to what CS people call a soft max function. But what I was taught is multinomial logistic. So it's just gonna transform the output of that final fully connected layer into a vector that is as long as however many classes you have. So this could be, you know, Hillary Clinton, Donald Trump, um, you know, Xi Jinping, and what I think there is Emmanuel Macron, right? Something like that, okay? And so that is what the matrix does. I should say the, the artificial neural network does. This is also a layer and that is also a layer, okay? So when you look at, 
at uh, papers using convolutional neural networks, especially from the computer science literature, they're going to have some architecture diagram, sometimes tables, but these diagrams are more, are more common and I think more intuitive. And so I just want to show you a few to get a sense um, of how they work and really how many parameters there are. Okay. So here is the diagram for AlexNet, which is the, um, the, the 2012 uh, neural network that made the huge advance in the ImageNet classification uh, competition and really led to the modern renaissance uh, of computer vision. So you can see they have a 224 by 224 image. They pass a, um, an 11 by 11 filter. They do this 48 times. And then there, the, these in here are, are the, 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 the rectified linear and the, the pooling. And so then they just keep doing it and doing it. You can see that the, the, uh, the, um, the, the, the feature maps get smaller and smaller. That's the hierarchical nature of it. So the output of an 11 by 11 run over 224 by 224 uh, is going to be smaller than 224 by, 2, by 224. I can't do that math quite right now on top of my head. And so each time that you're passing a, 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 a neuron, uh, a, a kernel over, over an input matrix, the output is going to be smaller. And so you have, you have the layers getting, getting smaller and smaller. Okay. And then these are the the fully connected layers. And then this is the classification. Deep face uh, is Facebook's facial recognition algorithm. And so this is how they represent it. Here I'm showing you the architecture from Francisco Cantu's 2019 APSR that looks at boat fraud in Mexico. I provide a link to it at the end of, of the paper, uh, but this is a, this is a, at the end of the presentation, this paper builds a neural network to identify um, altered uh, print ballots. And then the, the, if, if the class is altered, that's an altered ballot. And then he correlates that with, with all sorts of political competition variables, okay? So that's why he just has two, uh, to, to um, classes, altered or not altered at the very end, okay? So we see there are a bunch of layers. There are always going to be some uh, matrix here, three by three, three by three, and then there are a lot per layer. And remember, the, the, the values of the kernel are the weights, and that's what we're... we're we're estimating that's that's what we're training the model to figure out and so what happens is that we have uh more than a ton of numbers we have what to me is uh, uh, parameters and i think an incomprehensible number of parameters to to estimate um you know i remember uh when i was in grad school in methods classes we would read papers about garbage can models and kitchen seek models where if you put if you put 10 variables or a couple dozen variables into your regression model, you can't interpret anything because you don't, you don't, it, it's too high dimensional and there's too much collinearity. And so you don't really know what's generating your, your Y hats. And that, that, that's a couple dozen variables, that's 10 variables. You know, if you have some fixed effects, maybe that's a couple thousand. But in this world, we're dealing with, with millions, of, right? So, so it, it, it's utterly incomprehensible. But a parameter in this sense is also, in this world, is different than a parameter in, in the regression world. For us, a parameter is, is a variable, like, like your parents' education, your parents' income level, how much education you've received, the quality of the school you went to, things that are, are very much uh, conceptually motivated, whereas here, a parameter is just one number out, out of millions. So, so it's a little disingenuous to say that it's... Um, it's, it's, it's as black a box as you would think if, if you had 60 million social science variables, it's still a black box, but, but uh, a parameter here is conceptually different than a parameter in, in our regression models. But nonetheless, just look at how big these numbers are. The M is, is per million. Okay. So since we're estimating a model with millions of parameters, 
we need both a whole lot of training data so that you don't just overfit something. And we need a whole lot of computation power. So this is why if you, if you read like, you know, popular coverage of, of computer vision work, they talk about how it would take Facebook months to train their model, right? Or it took Google several weeks to train their model. And, you know, you had millions of images. And I remember when I was first starting this, this work, I was like, well, there's, there's no way, you know, that, that I can compete with that, both, both not really having the time as an assistant professor, then needing to calibrate a model and needing to get enough images and enough computational power to do it. And so it seemed like this is a real uh, privileged reserve. But in fact, that's not how, how the vast majority, I, I'll, I'll say almost any social scientist is going to use computer vision. In fact, what you're going to do is take a model that's already been trained, take a model that already has its tens of millions of parameters optimized, and just tweak it a little bit with training data that you give it, okay? So what that means is, let's actually go back. What transfer learning means is you take all of this that someone else did, and then you just redo the fully connected layers at the end with your own training data. So you're re-estimating these parameters here, but all of these are frozen. You don't need to figure out the lower level features of images because they're pretty universal. So if I'm building a classifier for, for protest, I don't need to build my own classifier that identifies straight edges and right angles or curves or faces or batons um, because that's already going to be captured in, in what someone else is already, in a model that someone else has already trained. So all you need to do is come up with a much smaller number of training images and then choose the model that you want and then, um, and then, and then retrain the last two layers, which, which is, is, is pretty straightforward in, 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 in Python, okay? So what are some models that you could, could use? I would say ResNet is the most common that is used. Uh, this is, is a modification of neural networks uh, of, a, of a CNN called, uh, the, the res is for, for residual. So they, they've done a little bit more than what I've just, just shown you. They trained it on, on the 1,000 labels in, in ImageNet, uh, so 1,000 classes that, that are very broad concepts. Um, and this seems to be like the, like, like the uh, uh, let's just say most common, best in class in, in 2016. I'm, I'm sure it's been surpassed now, OK? There are other classifiers which are built for, for more custom tasks. So there are classifiers if you want to identify places there are, identify, there are classifiers if you want to, to, to do better at faces. There are certain classifiers for object detection and so on. I don't think I put chasm in here. Um, I do, I'll, I'll get to that in, in just a second, I believe, okay? So what you'll, you'll probably do is use Python. I'll get to that when I talk to tools and the hugging face library because the hugging face library contains thousands of, of pre-trained models. So you'll find someone's paper where they introduce their fancy new classifier, the fancy new convolutional neural network. And then hopefully they, they put it in Hugging Face and then you just go download it from Hugging Face. And the months of work that it took them to build that model, you then have in just a couple of minutes, right? So, so this is how, for my work, we got a ResNet 50, for example. This is how you would get any of these. Or, or that one, you would just get it from, from hugging face, okay? So then your task as the, the researcher is to get, is, is to first figure out the, the model that you're gonna fine tune, that's the previous slide, and then get training data. This is the equivalent of, of in the natural language processing world <coughs> of the, <coughs> the text 
excuse me, <clears throat> of the text that you're going to label, the tweets that you're going to label, or the congressional speeches that you're going to label, or the newspaper articles that you're going to label. You get as much of those as possible, and you do as good a job of po as possible um, of, of getting things that are balanced on parameters that you care about. So what I mean is if I want to, to study protest and I only download images, protest images from the United States, well, then I'm unlikely to, um, to, to pick up features that, that only exist in the United States, but I might not recognize protest elsewhere. So like in, in Venezuela, a lot of protests occur uh, in, indoors where people are like holding signs and you don't see that much in the United States. So if you're not balanced across types of protests, protest size, uh, um, let's say, um, probably features of, pro uh, I'm going to leave that comment aside. If you don't have balanced training data, you're, you're not going to, you're, you're going to miss a lot when you apply your classifier to, to, to unseen data. Now, this is not unique to, uh, to computer vision. This is a common machine learning problem. Okay. There's no hard and fast rule for how many images to use. You always do more better. Uh, I used 44,000 for my, my protest work. I believe uh, Han with Chasm, you used more than that even. I, I could be wrong, but, but the point is just use as much, as much as possible, okay? So I just want to, to emphasize again that you're going to uh, use a pre-trained model. Okay, so then how do you know that what your model thinks an image is, the scene classification, or the, the, the face classification or the object detection, how do, you, how do you have confidence that it's doing the right thing when you can't look at any individual parameter because there, there are so many and, and a parameter that's a 0.3, a weight or a two like is, is meaningless. So what, what do you do? So here, here are some of the, the most straightforward ways to, to do it. The, the first ones are gonna be kind of from the computer science world. And then at the end, I'm gonna show you um, what is going to be more, more intuitive for, for a, a social science audience. Um, so there's this concept of deconvolutional neural networks where um, what, what they do is they just, <clears throat> you, you peek at each, in between each layer. So you look at the output of, 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 of layer one, and then you, you try to unwind it, and then you figure out which parts of the image that that, that first layer is is, 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 um, is activating on. You do that for the second layer, the third layer, and so on. The authors call that deconvolving. And then you can, you can, you can you know, show parts of images that, that are most activated and get a sense for, for what each filter is doing. So, so these images are taken from this paper, but what you can see is that as we go higher up in the hierarchy, as we get to, to deeper and deeper layers, the features of images that are being selected are more human recognizable. So in this paper, uh, what, they, <clears throat> what they're doing is that in this grid of, of 81 images, the four, the four dark black lines are, are four different classes. And then they've just chosen a sample, sample images for, from each class. So here I would say, you can't really tell anything. In the second layer already, we can see that there's some blueness that's getting picked up on, some maybe catching, and uh, maybe a sky, and let, let's call this uh, like red stuff, okay? In the third layer, we can see that now this class appears to be, it could be faces. Notice it's picked up um, like the, the facade of, of a windmill. The windows pull it to be like eyes. The color is, is say, similar color to, to the other faces. And even the curvature kind of looks like a forehead. Here we look like we're getting brown animals, but also a, a tan man's back, okay? Here we're getting watches. And you can see then over here, I don't know why I drew that circle. You can see the, the, the um, I don't wanna say features because I don't mean that in, in, the, in the, the feature map sense, but the, the characteristics of the image that each layer is picking up on. So the curves, Versus, versus what looks like maybe, maybe colors and some patterns and then something that's unrecognizable. Um, this paper is frustrating because each layer they show to demonstrate the deconvolution, <clears throat> it's not the same classes in, 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 this, in, uh, in the sample images. So what I mean is this top left here 
is not the same class as the top left here and the top left here. So it's a little confusing, confusing as you go across the different layers, okay? I personally really like gradient weighted class activation mapping, which is going to highlight the pixels that most contribute to, to whatever class you care about. So here's an example of a protest image uh, from, from my work. So this is, is, is the Sel Selvaraju papers te technique applied to my, my images. And you can see that, that this image, it's really picking up on the signs and the faces to get classified as a protest. For the police class, it does a good job of picking up on, on the police vests, maybe even the, uh, the, the helmets as well. And I can't tell if it's picking up on tear gas or, or a tree, you know, it, I, that's not enough to, to, to throw off the classification, but it's, it's picking up on, on, on the people kind of congregating, okay? Um, you then should, you need to choose the level of accuracy that you want. And so what you then need to do is once you've applied your, your trained model to unseen images, you then have to go back, you then have to, to have uh, humans look at this new the set of unseen images and say, yes, this is of that class. No, that is, this is not of that class. Yes, yes, no, no, and so on. And then you can build a precision recall curve and then you decide where in the, the um, where in that curve you want to draw the threshold for saying that this image is about the scene, okay? So what do I mean by that? Well, for, for the, the protest classification task in my work, you have an output that is, is protest or no protest, um, so, so two classes, and then you get a number, it's called like 0.4, and then, then 0.6, and then we found that we wanted this number to be greater than 0.849 for us to say that an image is of, of protest. And then so once you get those class um, estimates, you should then inspect them. So now we're starting here, we're, we're in the, the social science realm, which is like show what your classifier thinks is of the class that, that you care about. So on the top, we have images that, that we call in our paper small group. And we can see that as the, the class um, likelihood, again, it's not exactly likelihood, but the class estimate gets bigger, then an image is more and more, uh, contains what, what we would call a small crowd, right? So here you have a couple of people, and we specifically define the task to be at about 20 people, more people, and then even more people, and then large crowd, well, we see this is a group of people, but it's only three people, some more people, some more people, and then even more people, okay? And then once you have these unseen images that both the classifier has looked at and human annotators have looked at, then look at the, the class estimate for images that your humans say, your, your annotators, say are, um, um, are of that class and are of not, and there should be a clear distinction. So this figure is from, from one of my protest papers with, with Jung Siak and, and in the revisions, we were asked to, to do this task. And so we found that for images where, Im where humans say, yes, it contains fire or police or protest or violence or state violence, that the average estimate from the classifier was much, much higher than the images where it said it was not. So our classifier is clearly more confident, rightly so, for images that humans say belong to that, to that class. Okay, so how will you do your image analysis? You should use Python and the PyTorch package is really the main takeaway. So unless there has been a new computer vision package in about the last six months since I made these slides in R, then you, you really can't do this stuff in R. R has, has implementations of, of open computer vision and then, then Vlib, both of those are, are, are implemented in, in C. And that's, like, that, that's the old pre-convolutional neural network approach to, to computer vision. If you want to build a, a deep neural network, if you want to use Hugging face. So if you want to 
uh, to use transfer learning, you're going to need to use uh, Python and then, and then PyTorch lets you do, do a lot more customization. Um, and it's, it's the, the package that, that Facebook actually put out uh, built on, on the, the work that, that they did. And so it, it's kind of de, the de facto um, uh, image, image library. The way that you use, you use NLTK for, for natural language processing, people use PyTorch for, for, for computer vision. You could also though, uh, not pre-train, or sorry, not, not, not fine tune, but just, just use networks that, that, that companies make available you know, for some free tier or, or then they'll, they'll charge. So the most common ones are Amazon recognition and then Google vision where you give them images and then they will give you um, objects detected in those images. They also both do OCR. Google will do landmark detection. I don't think Amazon does that. So Google can tell you, oh, this is the Eiffel Tower or this is a government building, things like that. They all have different, um, you know, features, I like product feature, not, not feature map, but, but competitive features that, that you know, they've, they've built to try to attract people, people to, to use their service. So you should look at these services and to see if they, will, if they will do what you want, as well as, you know, how, how expensive they are. Um, using recognition vision, Microsoft, um, is the equivalent of just taking a, uh, a, a model from Hugging Face and not doing fine tuning. Right, so just feeding your images to some, some model someone else has, has made and, and then taking the out, output given back. Um, aside from, from cost, I mean, the, the cost I wouldn't say is crazy bad, but you still have to pay. Aside from cost, the, the main drawback of, of giving your images to an online service is that they're opaque. You don't really know the models they're using. You also don't even know the, class, the classes that they, they give. So that is, you're not, you, you don't know if you can detect protest using recognition or Google vision, unless someone else has done it, or you give them some images and you see if they give you back th those classes. That is, for, for the companies, these are like trade secrets. And so they don't really tell you what's going on behind the scenes. So it's even more opaque than, um, than like a, a neural network that, that you use on your own. Okay. Here are so, some online resources as well that I find, find useful. Um, so I have about five minutes left. Um, so I'm going to just quickly go through a couple of examples, like way too quickly. And, and then, and then we'll basically be, be at the end. Uh, so, so this is a paper under review. This paper is at ICWSM. Uh, let's not go into theory. So what we did is we take uh, 10 million tweets from, from the 2017 Unite the Right rally in the United States. This was the first far right rally after Donald Trump's uh, inauguration where, where a bunch of neo-Nazis came out you know, saying, hey, we're in power, et cetera, we're the best. And there was a lot of violence around this after, their image, after, after the event. We had 800,000 images. And then what we did is we just took the, um, the, the last, um, the last fully connected layer, so not the soft max layer that gives you the class probabilities, but the last fully connected layer from just an off the shelf ResNet 50. And then we did clustering. So I, I believe we just did K-means clustering even, but this is not computer vision. This is just, you know, cl clustering. Um, and we found the 1000 largest clusters. And so that is the 1000 most duplicated images. And then we, we hand labeled those, those clusters. We said, oh, this, this cluster is about neo-Nazis. This cluster is about a crash. This cluster is about the driver and so on. And that's how we found topics in the images. So here's an example of an image from the KKK topic. A topic can have multiple clusters. So we had a thousand clusters that we then grouped into, I believe this was 13 topics. There's a KKK topic, a Nazi topic, and then these, these are all the topics. And so we then compare how individual accounts and media accounts in the US or abroad differ in their framing of the event. And so the thing that jumps out most obviously is that international media accounts focus on the most sensationalist parts of the, of the event. 
That is the crash where, where Heather Heyer was killed and the use of KKK imagery, okay? The, the, uh, the media, both domestically and internationally do this. Uh, abroad, it's just the international media. Notice individuals abroad do not really focus on the, the sensationalism as much as media do. And then we also show that individuals have much longer attention spans that they engage in framing for much longer than media, whether they're domestic or international. We also look at the ideological distribution of, of frames using Pablo Barbera's uh, techniques. And then we use, for, so now for the, the ICWSM paper, we look at how Democrats and Republicans, uh, the images that they share. That is, how, how do they frame themselves and how does that framing vary based on, on party and gender? So for this, all we did was we gave images to, to uh, this, this uh, part of Google Vision that they called the label detection API. And we just found what labels are, are returned. And so these are the labels that most discriminate Democrats. And on the right, we have the labels that most discriminate Republicans. And then in the paper, we have a lot of qualitative discussion on what we think we learned from this. So from Republicans, we see, we see more emphasis on, on, on hierarchy, of course, the color red, and maybe so, some economic concerns. Uh, the, the Democrats, we felt was just a bit more diverse in that it was a little less cohesive on what they try to, to emphasize. Oh, and I should say, we noticed we, we, um, we, we separate by, by male and female. And then we look within party, and uh, this is on top of a cross body party. Okay, so um, I don't know why I put this bonus here because that's what we did in, in, in the Charlottesville paper. Okay, so I'm at 45 minutes, so I think this is good timing. So if you want to learn more, you can look at, at my methods paper, uh, Francisco and Michelle have methods paper, and then Andre, you and Nora ha have a, a, um, uh, a Cambridge element. This is the vote fraud paper that I showed the architecture diagram for earlier. This is my computer vision paper where we look at images shared on Twitter to understand violence and protest dynamics. Um, and then here, this citation was in here before I knew Han was going to be here. Here they, they, they detected protests using Weibo posts in, in, in a really cool, impressive uh, paper that's been cited in a ton already. Okay, so can you use images? If yes, use a model that someone else has already created. Make sure you validate your results. And then once you trust the output of the model, that's usually when the social science work starts, unfortunately. It's like you have to do this, all this other extra work up front to, to get image data that you then will, will, will use for qualitative interpretation or regression modeling or, or cluster analysis and so on, okay? Uh, thank you for your time. And, and again, here's the link to, to the paper. Okay, I'm done. Great, thank you so much. And it, it's funny that I think the suggestions I gave students like last week is exactly the set suggestions you All gave right. them, you know, right? <laughs> so, All right, perfect. Well, the same line here. Uh, uh, I think there's a question in the chat box and other yeah. people feel free to, you know, just uh, type Q or just unmute and ask questions. Yeah, so, so Cheng asks about TensorFlow, um, and I, it, I'm just ignorant here. I mean, I, I, know, I know what it is, um, but I've, I've not seen it used in, in, the, in the computer vision papers that I look at, and so I, I've never dug into to why that, that is, is the case. Uh, it's my understanding that it's not explicit. I think it's not explicitly. I, I could be wrong about that, um, but I don't see it used much. Uh, uh, okay, while well, people are kind of thinking about their questions, let me ask a more general question. Because like, I think uh, like in our several previous like days topic, like sentiment analysis, uh, you, you know, is, is a topic that comes up pretty frequently. Yeah, right. People talk about, you know, using text or audio data to do, you know, uh, sentiment analysis. And I realized in your research and you actually 
you really focus more on the objective side of the category rather than the you know emotions, which is mm -hmm. more on the subjective side. So do you feel it's like you know it's very hard to detect emotions uh, from images, and what is your you know considerations here? Yeah. Um, so great question, Han. Um, I think it's actually very easy to detect emotions from images for emotions that are easily visible in a face. So for a narrower subset of emotions like happiness, fear, anger, grief, uh, I think those are actually easier to detect because it's people's body language is very hard to, to control. That is, it's very hard for us to, to lie about our, our, our feelings via our, our faces, whereas with text, we can kind of be strategic about what we say. It's a lot harder to be strategic with, with your body language. Um, and then it's, it's, it turns out it's, it's incredibly difficult to really measure sentiment or emotion in, in text um, because you need to know a lot of context about what's being spoken about. You usually need to know the, the political orientation of the speaker. Um, and, then, and then there can be sarcasm, which, which often just flips what, what you're reading. Um, so I've thought about this a lot in the context of, of a paper I'm working on about, about the Syrian civil war where we're trying to measure emotion in, in, in tweets and it's just super difficult. And, and it's a whole field of, of computer science and, and linguistics um, that, that I think is, is kind of, um, um, I don't know enough to say it's a dead end, but, but for the same reason you know, that I think it's hard to use text for, for event data, I think it's also hard to use text for, for emotions. So if, if there's an emotion that you care about that you, you can reasonably claim is, is visible in people's faces, then, um, then I think that is, is, is actually better than, than text analysis um, and, and something that, that I hope to do in the future because we know that, that people's emotional response to protest is a large driver of their decision to protest. And so if we can see the emotions that people are expressing at protest, we might have a better understanding of, of of um, why those emotions get triggered and then how they affect uh, future protest. Um, future, like people deciding to, to protest or not. Um, so I don't, uh, I'm gonna keep going on this because I don't see anyone's hand raised or, or anything in the chat, but feel free to interrupt me. I'm gonna share a different screen, interrupt me if anyone has a question um, of, of some data sets and specifically this, um, this group called Unsplash, which is a, a copyright free source of high quality images. Um, I forget exactly how I learned about it, but the, the idea is that you don't have to pay like Getty or the AP for images, or if you're taking an image from somewhere, uh, often it has a watermark across it, right? Which is fine. People need to claim ownership of intellectual property, but it, it's, ugly to share and then also is going to confuse your classifier. So, so this, is, this website is millions of, of, of images. And so you can see what is anger. And now I have training data of anger, right? I download these images. Um, I believe the tags come with it. And then now I, I, I have large corpuses of, of of whatever I care about, okay? Anyway, so this is where I would go if I wanted to measure emotion. That's uh, fantastic. Uh, other questions? Uh, I don't see any right now. Okay, uh, so maybe uh, because I think lots of participants here are really new to this. Um, so, um, so I think, um, have you mentioned about like some kind of like generic tools that you know really like novice user can play around? For example, I, I remember like um, already trained data set by like Google and other. Um, so I think um, you know for our participants, if they play with like some existing like pre-determined a uh, pre uh, trained data sets and you know just you know you know uh, like pick a picture and just enter into that you know. Uh, the uh, uh the pre pre or, or I think it's, it's something like Google, right? So I just remember the exact term, right? So I think if you could introduce some of the tools that are already existing, 
uh, maybe you, you you might not recommend that to for academic research, but at least for like education purpose, I think it would be great. Yeah, no, great question, Jamin. Um, so first off, I think it's fine to use these for academic research. Um, I was just letting people know about about some shortcomings that also some reviewers might not like. So uh, Tamar Mitz has a paper that I, I put on the final slide, and and she uses Amazon recognition to understand what ISIS accounts on Twitter are are sharing. They're the images they share, and that paper is in, in the Journal of Politics, one of our one of you know the best poli sci journals. So you can you can totally use these. So I I would I would use Amazon recognition or Google Vision with images that you care about. These could be images from your phone. Maybe you have some research project in mind. Maybe you go to Unsplash and download images with, with the keyword anger. And then you can, through a graphical interface, you could upload the images to recognition or Google Vision. Or certainly uh, there's a Python library. I have to believe that there are, are libraries for Amazon recognition and Google Vision. So that you you can you can get the the labels back using um, you know just just a few lines of 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 R um, and and images that you know uh, what they should be right. So I'm saying if if you get images from your phone of the ocean or images of of the ocean from Unsplash, then you can see well does Amazon recognition recognize that this is an ocean? Does it see a beach? Does it see waves? Uh, and then maybe do that for recognition and vision Google Vision. And see how how the differences, uh, what the differences are across the services. But I, I would I would start with, with these because you don't have to really do any training. All you have to do is get your own images. Um, to get images, I would go to Unsplash. Um, Kaggle is going to have like competitions where they have images. Um, or for the social sciences, I always go to um, Harvard's Dataverse where replication materials are put. And then you can find papers there that, that have images and, um, and uh, use that, you use those images, download images from there. I believe that um, the, the Cambridge Element, the Andre and Nora work, I believe they've given sample images for, for their stuff as well. This one, I think they have sample images. Good question. Uh, is this new chat? Yeah. Uh, so Baichi asks, can we filter by uh, uh, region and can you batch download images? So the answer to the, the region is yes, if there's an image tag. So the, the user has to upload, has, has to tag it as being in a location. Um, that, that metadata that often comes with an image is, is stripped. Um, I've only played around with this for, for a couple hours and a not insignificant percentage of images did have location. So, so it, it seems to be the case that, that people do add location, I, I don't know, 10, 20, 30% of the time. Um, you can batch download images. There's an API. There's also, um, they actually have data available uh, for free for academics. Um, uh, somewhere in, in here on their GitHub page, you can, you can download a bunch of images. Yeah. Um, while I have this tab open, I'll just show you some other things. So Flickr, I, I've seen a lot of there used to be a lot of image analysis using Flickr because people used to use Flickr a lot more, but, but you can get a lot of images from, from Flickr. Um, here, if you wanted to analyze satellite imagery, uh, Maxar is one of the big providers, and then you can get satellite imagery around a bunch of nat natural disasters. Uh, satellite image analysis can be the same as what I just showed you, but it can also be different because Satellites collect not just color images, but, but other spectrum as well, like infrared um, and a whole bunch of other stuff that, that I don't quite know. But the point is, analyzing non-color images is, is slightly different than, than analyzing color images. Data, I should say. Uh, good question, Yuji. The question is, uh, do you have any suggestions on whether to, to fine tune 
or um, use Google Vision it doesn't depend on the context. Um, if you're just starting out, I would start with Google Vision. Um, the more, let's say, politically sensitive what you want is going to be, the more you're going to have to do something on your own. So none of, of the off-the-shelf solutions, Google Vision or Amazon recognition, was going to tell me um, if there are police in an image. They weren't going to tell me how violent an image was. That's not like a, an object. You can't, uh, it's, you know, there's no physical thing that, that is violent. And so I had to fine tune a classifier that I, that I wanted. Um, so I would first start with Google Vision or recognition, look, give, image, give it images that you care about, look at the labels that get returned and do the labels seem to capture what you want conceptually to measure? If yes, great, no problem, keep going. If no, then you're gonna have to uh, use pre-trained models and fine tuning. Cool. I think it's also about time. Sorry, Han, let me, let me just say, I'm happy to share oh, these yeah. slides with anybody. I don't know yeah. if you want me to email it to, to you or Jamin or, or what, but I'm, I'm more than happy to share these slides. Yes, please. Yeah, that would be yeah. nice. Yeah, yeah that would be nice. Okay. Uh, thank you for, for giving us talk uh, in the middle of time, child terror. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. so really well, it's, it's nice time. to have the break. I, I appreciate it. Go back to my wife, but it's, it's good for me <laughs> to have a change of pace. Okay. All okay. right. Well, thanks, everybody. Thanks, Jamie. Thanks, Han. Thanks, everyone else, for showing up. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Bye.